Hello, welcome people already there. We'll start in like two, three minutes.
All right. Um, it's seven o'clock here in um, The Hague in the Netherlands. And uh, welcome uh, everyone joining here through Zoom and through Facebook and other channels um, to the first uh, of five lectures um, on Old Nubian. Uh, my name is um, Vincent van Gerven Uy, um, and I happen to be uh, a scholar uh, focusing on the Old Nubian language. Um, we're going to do five times one hour. I don't know if what I'm going to say fits in one hour, if it's more or less, but I guess we'll figure it out together. Um, if you have questions, you can uh, post them in the um, uh, chat, uh, even though I have no idea where the chat window currently is in my Zoom, but I suppose that uh, at some point I'll figure that out. Um, there will be some people that most probably will still want to enter and I'm allowing them to uh, join. We have had some Zoom bombers earlier today, so we're trying to be a bit careful uh, with who is being let in, into the Zoom. Um, it would also be great if everybody is muted. All right, okay, so I'm just gonna start and we'll see who shows up uh, and who is joining us on Facebook as well. Um, so today we'll talk about um, the history and context of Old Nubian and its uh, writing system. So it gives you an introduction of you know, uh, where Old Nubian was written, uh, the cultural context in which this was done, and also how the people who wrote Old Nubian uh, wrote that language. Um, and this is what we'll do for the rest of the week. So tomorrow um, we'll talk about noun phrases uh, on Wednesday. We'll talk about quantification, predication, and person. On Thursday, we'll do the verbal system, most of it. And then uh, on day five, we'll do sentences and subordination. Oh, I found a chat window. Perfect. Great. Um, so let's start. Um, Old Nubian is a language that was written in this area right here, um, between around 500 and 1500 uh, of our current uh, dating system. Um, as you can see, most of the Old Nubian finds are in the area that um, in that period was called Nobedia. Um, this is mainly the case because this is where all the excavations were done during the uh, Aswan uh, Dam campaigns. And so that's where most of the archaeological focus has been, uh, let's say, ever since the 1950s. Um, however, you see that also uh, north uh, of Aswan, we find some texts up to Wadi Natrum, um, where we find uh, the grave monument for King George, and also rather to the south. Um, Currently, there are still excavations being done in what is uh, basically Makuritan territory. Um, these are still ongoing, producing lots of new texts. Uh, not a lot, but like compared to the corpus of that we have uh, a lot. Um, but even we find evidence for Old Nubian here in Jebel Abu Najila and uh, downwards in Soba, where we find uh, some inscriptions of um, uh, Nubian type uh, a Nubian type language. So uh, especially, let's say here, uh, around, um, around these dried up rivers, um, there is still a lot to be uh, uh, um, uh, found and excavated. Uh, and we simply do not know yet uh, what is under the sand. Um, so most of what we know about the language is based on the material found uh, 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 in, in what was formerly Nobedia. Um, so our knowledge of Old Nubian as a language um, basically starts only in the 19th century. So we are dealing with a language that was probably written until the 15th century, 15th, 16th century. Um, then uh, the knowledge of uh, this uh, literary culture uh, basically disappeared um, until the 19th century. So only a few centuries after, at, at the point of which uh, through uh, colonial conquest, um, the Western uh, world um, 
let's say, rediscovered this, uh, this literary culture. Uh, and so one of the first uh, recordings of this rediscovery we find um, in uh, a series of books that was published uh, after Napoleon's campaign in uh, Egypt and Nubia uh, by a man called Francois Gao. And we see here uh, um, uh, one of these inscriptions. He did not read Coptic nor Old Nubian and his transcriptions are terrible um, uh, because he didn't understand what he was transcribing. And as you can see here, you know, you see some letters look like Nubian letters, but then many others like this, for example, like he had no idea what he was writing. Um, so this changes with the Prussian expedition uh, a couple of decades later, where Richard Lepsius uh, visits uh, many of the same uh, sites. And uh, he is a much better draftsman and uh, also a much better linguist. Uh, and so he is able to uh, provide much better uh, uh, drawings of uh, old Nubian inscriptions that he finds during his uh, expedition. And here we see uh, an inscription from Ibrim, uh, a, a graffito um, that uh, he transcribed here. And this is uh, with the standard opening invoking the, the, the Holy Trinity. Um, then uh, after these two big exhibitions, so one of Napoleon and one of the Prussians, so the Germans, um, we see uh, uh, activity by um, uh, 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 state institutions. Uh, and in this case, the Royal Prussian Library. Um, they sent out uh, in this period around the turn of the century, multiple uh, people around the world to acquire uh, documents. Uh, for their collections. And um, the Royal Prussian Library found uh, two Old Nubian uh, 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 documents, uh, one of which is the uh, lectionary that we have, uh, and they bought them in Cairo. The problem with these acquisitions is, is because they bought them in Cairo, we have no idea where they came from. Um, uh, there is no call of phone that is, that is uh, still present, and so uh, even though it's wonderful to have these texts because they are not excavated properly and they are not, we have no understanding about their context, it is very difficult to place them, you know, in a chronological uh, setting. It's very difficult to uh, understand their usage. Um, but this is simply how uh, Western institutions acquired these documents um, uh, in the past. One would hope that things go differently nowadays. Um, so we have this lectionary, which is a which is a uh, important uh, document in Old Nubian. It contains uh, several uh, texts from the Bible, um, and uh, the Star Ross text, um, which is an apocryphal text, uh, which deals mainly uh, with a, a hymn on the cross and a uh, let's say conversation between uh, Jesus and his apostles after uh, Jesus. Uh, returns to earth uh, after his uh, resurrection. And so he tells them kind of all the secrets of his, uh, of his teachings. In this case, particularly dealing with the, with the Holy Cross. Um, the second institution that went shopping uh, is the British Museum. Um, this time they went shopping. They usually, uh, you know, a lot of their collection uh, is acquired by less, uh, let's say, uh, uh, pleasant means. Um, and they purchased um, a codex from what they call Arab nomads. We again do not really know um, where these uh, documents are from. Uh, supposedly they're from Edfu, um, but this is not 100% uh, clear. Uh, and here um, we are dealing with on the left side, um, the miracle of St. Minas, which is a uh, Nubian miracle story. Uh, it's really, it's a wonderful story uh, about uh, 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 an Egyptian saint who um, um, makes sure that a woman uh, becomes fertile and pregnant. And so the whole story revolves around this egg um, that a sailor acquires from a woman. Then he fails to bring it to a church. He ends up uh, eating the egg. And there is this wonderful final, uh, wonderful final scene in which the saint, Saint Mina, arrives kicks the man on the head and the, the, the sailor gives birth to a chicken 
Um, and then the chicken is given back to the woman and then she becomes uh, pregnant. Um, on the left and so on the right, we have the nice or the pseudo Nicene canons, which is a collection of, uh, uh, let's say, church laws or like behavior rules um, that we do not have any attestation for. It. For these specific rules, we don't have any attestation outside this specific text. And so there's still a lot to learn about uh, the rules of the uh, Nubian church in that period also from this uh, from this text. Um, so after, uh, let's say, the period of uh, 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 the colonial period, we enter into another period in which uh, the Nubian lands were threatened not by uh, invading Western armies, um, but by invading water. And um, we see here uh, during the 60s a massive campaign uh, initiated by UNESCO and the Egyptian and the Sudanese government to salvage um, um, the, the remains of, of uh, thousands of years of uh, Nubian civilization. Um, little was known when they started how much they would find. Uh, and here uh, we see one of the biggest discoveries uh, uh, during those excavations, which is the discovery of Faros, which was a major town, if not the capital of Nobadia, with multiple cathedrals and churches uh, with exquisite uh, wall paintings. And you see one also behind me uh, from that same excavation series. Um, the same excavations also yielded a number of uh, manuscripts um, which uh, have been published. Um, then we have excavations uh, in Sarah East by um, the uh, Oriental Institute in Chicago. And um, this is a particularly important find because it's the longest Old Nubian text that was found. Uh, the Sarah East Codex, it's a homily by uh, Psudic um, which partially overlaps with the Star Ross text. So there is a really interesting uh, intertextuality there between these two, uh, between these two texts. Um, and um, the discovery of these texts, uh, uh, so much after the, the first major texts were found, allowed a lot of new insight into the into the grammar of Old Nubian. Um, because as I have uh, argued uh, a little while ago, this is actually one of the oldest uh, uh, forms of the language that we have attested. Uh, so even though this is this is this is of course a copy that was made later, the original translation is is probably one of the oldest translations that we have in Old Nubian. And so it tells us a lot about the, the grammar of the language um, and its grammatical development. Um, also very important uh, in the history of uh, description of Nubian are the excavations in Qasir Ibrim by the um, Egypt Exploration Society. Um, they are important because uh, Qasir Ibrim gave us an enormous amount of uh, documents, not only in Nubian, but also in Greek and Coptic and Meroitic and, so they, and Arabic. And so they really showed um, the multilingual environment in which uh, Old Nubian was a part. Right, so we are dealing with a society that was literate, not only in Old Nubian, but also like in Coptic, in Greek, and in Arabic, uh, especially in later centuries. And um, the, the materials coming out of Qasir Ibrim, most of which is documentary, so like letters, contracts, and so on, really gives us a, a very good view uh, um, of, of the society at that point in time. You know, multiple languages, a lot of trading, um, uh, you know, I would say a, a vibrant, a vibrant literary life. Um, and so uh, these documents, which are most of them, which are late, give us, let's say, the other side uh, uh, of, uh, of Old Nubian. Uh, uh, an Old Nubian that, that is much closer to a spoken language and also much closer to, uh, to a language like Nobin, which is currently still spoken in that region. Um, Currently still ongoing also are uh, excavations in Old Dongola. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to go there myself uh, two years ago uh, to work, for example, on the text that you see here, which is a psalm. Um, Old Dongola was the capital of Makuria and uh, the excavations uh, of that capital are still ongoing and basically everywhere that they excavate they find uh, you know uh, uh, new new inscriptions and, and graffiti and so on and uh, so these were discovered um, 
quite some time ago, but were not described yet. And so uh, uh, an edition of this text uh, will come out, hopefully, I think by the end of the year in Orientalia. Um, as you can see, um, this is difficult work. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the letters are, uh, 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 are difficult to read, um, but then also because it's a photograph, uh, uh, it's even more difficult. So if you're there and you can look at them um, then, and you know what it says, then that already helps a lot. Um, finally, another site from which um, uh, there are no new materials, but a lot of the materials are still in, in museum archives and not published uh, are the uh, ARCA uh, exhibition, uh, excavations in, uh, in Jebel Adda. Um, here, for example, we see a, a burial shroud, which was found in, in the museum archives. We didn't know it existed. And so it contains a rather well-preserved Nubian text um, uh, with, with a prayer. So this uh, body was wrapped in this uh, shroud. Um, and so again, this is also a type of material that you know, we still have to publish. Uh, we're working on it. And so hopefully maybe next year, and this will also be, uh, will be published. So, what type of material do we have in, um, in Old Nubian? So you already saw, like I selected a few different types of uh, texts uh, in, the, in the previous slides, um, but basically the material can be divided into two distinct um, parts. So in liturgical texts and in a document, uh, literary text and, and documentary text. And so with literary texts, we talk about uh, texts that are used within uh, a, a Christian context. So for example, uh, lectionaries, psalms, sermons, canons, and prayers. So these are used uh, uh, within the church, within a church or monastic context. Um, another thing that maybe had a little bit of a wider uh, uh, spread were uh, so-called miracle stories, like uh, the story of Saint Mina. Um, it makes sense that these stories had a much wider circulation than only inside uh, religious contexts because they uh, are an attempt also to popularize um, uh, Christianity. Then for documentary texts, um, we have a really a wide variety of, of, of different types of texts and probably this list is not even exhaustive. So we have legal texts. So you mainly like contracts about land. So there was a lot of land dealing between, uh, uh, different, uh, uh, between different people, um, sales of slaves, uh, the freeing of slaves, um, but also like royal pro proclamations uh, are part of this. Um, we have horoscopes, we have lunaries, which are sort of like horoscope, but they're tailored to the, to the lunar month. Um, we have a lot of letters um, between bishops and priests, between bishops and, and, and functionaries, um, between private people. Um, we have a lot of visitor inscriptions, and these are usually very short, um, but we have a lot of them, like in the thousands. Um, of people leaving their names and short prayers and short, you know, short sentences uh, in, in religious spaces. Um, and then in those spaces, we also have things like legends. And so legends are usually texts that accompany images. Um, and uh, uh, they give us information of what is, what is, what is depicted on a, on a particular image. So, we find Old Nubian texts on a variety of materials. Um, so we, we have seen parchment, paper, leather, uh, mostly late texts, uh, clay. Um, so these are like pot shards, uh, ostraca or pottery inscriptions. And so the difference that you usually make is ostraca are pot shards that are used as a writing material. So the text is usually on the entire shard, whereas pottery inscriptions, you have a vase and then there's inscription on the vase and then the vase is usually broken. And so that is, that is unintentional. Um, then we have inscriptions on plaster, um, like graffiti and dipinti. Graffiti are usually scratched. Uh, dipinti are usually painted uh, with a brush. And then we have inscriptions also on stone, um, with again, graffiti and dipinti, but we also have monumental inscriptions on marble, for example. Uh, not that many, but, but a few. Um, and so all of these different substrates bring with them uh, different ways of, of approaching a text and some of them are easier to read than others. Um, so 
now that we know a little bit about um, you know the, the the types of texts and where they come from and how we have we have um, let's say gotten our hands on these, um, let's look a little bit at at the linguistic history of um, uh, of Old Nubian. Um, so what I'm going to say here is based on what we currently understand about the development of Old Nubian and its language family, um, but much of this is still uh, uh, under investigation, people are constantly writing about this. And so this is very much a sketch um, that really shouldn't be taken uh, at face value. So this is the, all of this is work in progress. Um, Old Nubian belongs to a language family that's called Nilo-Saharan. Um, it's one of the major language families in, in Africa, um, but it's also at the same time, the least well-described language family uh, uh, of Africa. And so there's still an enormous amount of work to do for us to understand precisely the linguistic context of Old Nubian. Um, and so like, let's, uh, let's have a look at, at what we know. Um, so there is an idea that um, within the nilo saharan family, you have a subgroup, which is called Northern East Sudanic. Um, the good thing about this group is, is that um, it is relatively well described um, uh, compared to the other branches of the nilo saharan family. Um, and so we can say with a little bit more certainty something about their, um, about how this language family developed. Also, because unlike with many other parts of this uh, nilo saharan uh, uh, language family, we have archaeological evidence to back up some of the linguistic claims, right? So once you know something about the movement of people, you can also make assumptions about the movement of languages. This is not always the same thing, and we should be very careful with that. Uh, but having said that, um, let's let's have a look at at uh, at what there is. So um, we start out here with what is termed Proto Northern Northern East Sudanic, uh, mainly here around the uh, Wadi Hawar. And so when we are talking about four thousand before Christ, um, this is actually a river. So there is vegetation. You can go fishing. Um, we're talking about an era in which much of what is currently Sahara was actually uh, 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 much more fertile. And so there was much more communication, let's say, uh, from, from east to west uh, along these riverbeds, uh, which were seasonally filled with water or sometimes uh, all year round filled with water. Um, as um, the climate became drier, so we're actually dealing here with the effects of climate change uh, uh, 6,000 years ago, uh, as the climate in the Sahara became drier, um, the people along the Wadi Hawar started to migrate to find water. And um, this is the reason for the uh, displacement, actually, that is driving most of the linguistic history of the Northern East Sudanic uh, language family. Um, so what we first see is um, the displacement uh, of uh, Proto-Taman and Proto-Nima speakers. These are the first people to, to branch off. Um, subsequently, um, we see a number of uh, groups branching off, including the Nara, um, which are supposedly first um, here around the Adbara. Uh, nowadays, they're in Eritrea. Uh, proto meroitic uh, focused around a Kerma culture and a C group um, which is an archaeological term um, and uh, which is assumed because of its influence later on on uh, Old Nubian, uh, as we will see. Um, so this is, let's say, the second, the first, the, sort of the first wave of migration is here. Then we have a second wave of migration into the Middle Nile Valley uh, around 2500 BCE. Um, and uh, an expansion of Meroitic in this uh, Middle Nile Valley as that became an important uh, political player uh, um, uh, in, in the Middle Nile Valley. And so we see with the, the growth of political prominence, uh, we see also the extension of this, uh, of this language group. Uh, meanwhile, along the Wadi Hawar and the Wadi Amilk, we find that we see the development of, of, of a proto-Nubian. Um, at this point, um, these uh, wadis are uh, really drying up, which then leads to the uh, final migration uh, wave, which is uh, a little bit um, before um, the turn of the millennium, with Nubian uh, tribes 
moving into the Middle Nile Valley and again uh, also, for example, to Kordofan Mountains. Um, they encounter there a well-developed uh, state. And uh, this doesn't, uh, uh, let's say, this doesn't go without resistance. Uh, and we see a steady decline uh, of the Meroitic Kingdom, or let's maybe we shouldn't talk about it in terms of decline, but we see a, a, an amalgamation of these uh, different ethnic groups um, up to the point uh, where the Meroitic state itself uh, and its language disappears. Um, but in its stead, we find these uh, uh, Christian kingdoms which are Christianized around, uh, around this, this period through Byzantine missionaries. Um, most probably speaking, uh, languages that are ancestral to the languages currently spoken in that area. So Nobin and uh, Dongolawi or Andandi. Um, at the same time, we also see a migration of the Nawa to their current uh, location uh, in Eritrea on the border with Ethiopia. And this then um, leads us to the final um, situation in which um, we have Nubian uh, speakers along the Nile, along the middle Nile, with uh, Matoki, uh, let's say a, a 16th century uh, migration uh, from the Dongolawi speakers here. Um, a cluster of uh, Northern East Sudanic languages around Kordofan Mountains um, and small pockets here uh, uh, south of the Wadi Hoar, or, or what used to be the, the Wadi Hoar, because it's completely dry right now. Uh, and the Nara here in, uh, in Eritrea. So this is our current, um, let's say, linguistic, uh, linguistic picture. Um, the development of uh, spoken languages, as, as I just sketched, is of course not the same as the development of a written language. Um, so what we see is, is that in terms of literacy, um, the picture uh, is much more complex, uh, uh, maybe also because we have a lot more information, because we have written documents uh, that we can consult. And so we see that, you know, in this, this period where uh, the Meritic state, uh, let's say, merges or dissolves into uh, these new Christian kingdoms, um, we see also the shifts in literacy. So on the one hand, we have uh, Meroitic, which is still written, uh, you know, both around Meroe and around uh, Balana. Um, we have, on the north, we have uh, Greek and Coptic. Um, in the south, we have Aksum, where there was Greek Gez and South Arabian. And so we have this really, um, let's say, we have this really uh, complex literary context in which then Old Nubian arises, um, as we see here. So we see that Old Nubian becomes a written language for both uh, the uh, Nobedia and Makuria. Uh, we see the development of another written language uh, in the Kingdom of Alwa um, that is a type of Nubian language, but it's not Old Nubian. Uh, we only have one relatively well-preserved inscription that we don't understand. So we can say it is definitely related to Nubian, but we don't, we cannot really read it very well. Um, at, while at the same time, we still have uh, uh, Greek and Coptic literacy here in the North. And so there is this constant interaction between on the one hand, uh, Old Nubian based on the Nubian language spoken by the people there and the literary cultures uh, of both Coptic and Greek that exert an enormous influence because uh, they bring with them or they come with with the package of Christianity. Um, we can also see this in the script, uh, which we will look at uh, shortly. So let's have a look at um, the phonology of the language itself and uh, and its script. So. Um, Old Nubian is a rather standard uh, Nubian language. Um, there's nothing really weird about it. Um, what is uh, typical is the absence of a uh, voiceless uh, bilabial plosive, uh, and also this distinction between uh, voiced and voiceless uh, velar consonants is rather weak. The distinction between uh, the alveolars is, uh, is strong, and um, 
for example, I, I, when you hear Andandi speakers nowadays, then it seems that there is also distinction in terms of place. So, so in Andandi, or at least the way I hear it, the T is sometimes nearly retroflex. So it may very well be that there's also a place distinction here uh, that we simply do not know now. Um, um, but this contrast, contrast is strong and, and persistent, uh, unlike, for example, in Coptic, um, where this contrast is weaker. Um, otherwise, we have a nice group of nasals, fricatives. We have this trill. I call it a trill. We don't know. Maybe it's a tap. Maybe it's a flap. Maybe it's you know something that is that is a little bit more exotic. Um, but it's it's some type of R sound. Um, we have an L sound, and we have two approximants or glides like a, a W, a W, and a Y. Um, then also the vowel system is quite uh, standard. So we have uh, five primary vowels that have a distinction in length. Um, we have tone, most probably. Uh, Nubian is a tone language. Uh, other Nubian languages like Midop and the Kordofan Nubian languages have tone. There is an argument that even uh, Andandi has remnants of tone uh, or maybe even a fully functional tone system. We don't even know that currently. Um, so it, it makes sense that uh, Old Nubian uh, uh, or its spoken variant had tone distinctions, uh, but these are not uh, written. So uh, probably high and low tone, um, but there's nothing really we can, we can say about it uh, uh, at the moment. So then we have a look at the, um, at the alphabet. Um, there are, um, how many characters are these? 30 characters. Uh, as you can see, um, mainly based on the Coptic alphabet. And we also should have a look a little bit at the pronunciation that you can see here. Um, so vowel characters do not indicate length. Um, this is one thing. We have a number of characters that we do not know exactly how they were pronounced simply because uh, Old Nubian or let's say Nubian phonology does not allow complex consonant clusters. So it, it seems unlikely that these things were pronounced as they were pronounced in Greek. Um, and so when we look here, we see that, you know, of this alphabet, uh, the largest amount uh, derives from Greek, um, plus the addition of a number of characters from Coptic. Um, in particular, the, the Gima is written, is written quite differently than it is in, in Coptic in terms of its uh, ductus. And then um, we have three characters that are traditionally called uh, enchoric. Uh, these are characters that derive from the Meoritic alpha syllabary. And so they actually provide very nice and concrete evidence that there must have at some point in the history of Nubian have been uh, a biliteracy between, uh, or at least for some scribes that were proficient in both Coptic and, and Meoritic, or both Greek and Meoritic, um, for this, for an alphabet like this to uh, to be developed for the Old Nubian script, um, for the Old Nubian language. And what is really nice is that these characters uh, from the Meoritic alpha syllabary precisely cover the, the the two sounds that are not present in Coptic, so the the velar nasal ng and the uh, palatal nasal ny. And we have an additional character for consonantal uh, the. So it's only used for the consonant and never for the, for the, uh, for the vowel u, for example, as you can see, um, uh, uh, there's, a dip, there's a digraph that is used for both the vowel and the consonant, but this one is only used for the, for the consonantal value. Um, so what is, what is really interesting about this is that um, Meroitic is an alpha syllabary, which means that every character has the value of a consonant plus vowel. Um, whereas Old Nubian is uh, an alphabet. So each, each consonant represents a, a single phoneme. Um, and so the question unsolved is really how did that development from how, how did it happen that, you know, a, a syllabic character was taken and this became a single phoneme. Um, this is of course a very interesting and exciting thing uh, in the history of the script. Um, that we do not know yet exactly how this um, how this happened. If we look at the inscriptions from uh, Soba and also some other inscriptions that were found in Bejraria and there's some other, there's one inscription I think in the Church of San Quintino, we see that there were other letters, non-Greek, non-Coptic, um, 
that were used in conjunction with Greek and Coptic letters to write a language that seems Nubian-like. Um, so it may very well be that scribes at a certain point in time started to uh, uh, experiment with ways to write uh, uh, the old Nubian language. Uh, and in, eventually um, this system prevailed. Um, but it, I think that you know, uh, there's evidence for a period in which uh, people really tried out different ways how to write, you know, sounds that you cannot write in, um, in Coptic letters. And so this is a very nice parallel with the development of the Coptic script, where you also see in, 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 in what, what people call, I think, pre-Coptic uh, pre text, you know, there are all kinds of characters that are uh, non-Greek, but are used to write uh, sounds from Coptic that are not in Greek. Um, and so you see kind of a repetition of this type of uh, 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 script history. Um, another aspect that Old Nubian has taken over from Coptic uh, is the use of the superlinear stroke. So this little stroke here over the sigma and here. Um, different from Coptic, it doesn't signify a schwa, but it signals uh, the uh, a vowel E. So Old Nubian uh, has no schwa. Uh, Nubian languages, uh, Midop developed a schwa, but uh, now Nubian languages have no schwa. And so it usually stands for an E sound. Um, an E that may in certain contexts actually may have been underdetermined, but I don't think it ever is realized as schwa. Um, there is, of course, some little variation on where it is placed. So uh, a jima is usually quite elaborate in its shape. And so it doesn't have space for a, a stroke on top. And so whenever you would want to have a stroke over this jima, it is placed over the previous uh, consonant. Um, was, oh, wait, I sorry, I skipped towards the very end. Um, yep. Then um, we have uh, the same stroke over vowels. Um, in that case, it usually signals um, the beginning of a syllable. Um, so you can see this particularly clear in, in, in this Greek loan word where you have trisagion, um, where the stroke is set over the alpha, indicating that we have a syllabification uh, between tris and agion. Um, and this also carries over um, into proper Nubian terms. For example, in this case, jan is the uh, verbal root and os is, uh, is a suffix. This is not consistently done. None of this is consistently done, in fact. Um, but this is how the sign seems to be used over vowels. And then finally, there seems to be a class of endings um, preceded by either a liquid or a jima, in which the superlinear stroke indicates a vowel before the consonant that precedes it. So we are dealing here with um, octagina, and not something like octagnia or, or octagna or something like this. Um, and this seems to be also not consistently done, but there are certain texts in which this is, this is quite frequent as uh, an orthography. All right, and I think that that um, concludes uh, my presentation for today. Um, if there are any questions, I can unmute people or you can write them um, in the chat. I see already that So has some questions. I'm going to unmute you, So. I think okay. you have the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, I'm So Miyagawa. Um, I'm a Japanese coptologist and new biologist and a student of um, Vincent. Um, yeah, student of all Nubia. And uh, I have two questions. First, um, I'm very interested in the doubled uh, vowel letters. In brown, he said it is um, corresponding to no being a uh, long vowel. But what do you think about it? Um, he said it is not so often attested. And my second question is that it's about the um, it, it's, uh, Sarah, Sarah East Codex. You said it is 
um, the oldest, the, the language written there is the is one of the oldest varieties of uh, old Nubian. But how did you find it, and how right. old is it? Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, so uh, for your question. So let's first go to your question about doubled vowels. I don't. I'm not sure if if I have an example here. Um, so the question is, in 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 some sometimes you find a vowel sign written twice. The question is, what does that mean? Um, it does appear to be the case that when a vowel sign is written twice and that that orthography alternates with the same word, the vowel written once, then this may be an indication that the vowel is actually long. Um, and indeed it is quite rare, but it seems that in the cases where this alternation happens and we have a word in Nobin um, with also a long vowel, then we can safely assume it's a long vowel. Um, there are also multiple words that can be reconstructed as having a long vowel because we have a long vowel in both Nobin and in Andandi. And it is thought that when we have a long vowel in both Nile Nubian languages, we also have a long vowel in Old Nubian, or at least it's safe to assume. Um, I have the feeling that certain orthographical variation may be more frequent with certain long vowels. Um, so it, in other words, that it seems that sometimes long vowels have certain orthographical variants in texts that short vowels don't have. But because we don't have a digital database of the texts yet, we cannot do any okay. statistical analysis on this. Okay. But I have hunches that, that, that we could say more about the interplay between vowel length and orthography than we currently are saying. Yes. Um, then, yeah. um, let's say the Sarah East Codex. So um, I can put up a link um, somewhere. Let me let me let me just pull this out really quick and put the link if if I can find it quickly. Um, so the Sarah East Codex uh, contains um, the uh, text of Psydegrisostomos uh, in Veneramilian uh, and Sermo. Um, I cannot. I'm not sure if I can drop this somehow. I'm trying to see if I can. No. Okay, I cannot. Um, I can. I can post this later. Um, but you can find the article actually on my Humanities Commons. Um, okay. uh, wait, I can just bring that up, um, and I can put the link actually. So, um, sorry. Just let me do this quickly. Then you have the article. Um, so what we did is we looked at um, the uh, other attestations of this text in Greek, Latin, and Syriac. Um, I did this work together with Alexandros Tsakos, uh, by the way. Um, and we looked at which um, other um, copies of this text, uh, the Old Nubian text was closest to in terms of language. Um, and it appears that the Old Nubian text is closest to the oldest attestations uh, of this sermon, uh, in particular, uh, a Latin translation from the sixth century, I think, sixth or seventh century. That was the closest, I would say, uh, a parallel to this, to this Old Nubian text. Um, the argument is, of course, a little bit more convoluted, but this suggests in turn that this translation to a Nubian was made from most probably a Greek text um, of a similar age, um, which then suggests that it was made also closer to that age of that uh, uh, Greek uh, prototype. Um, this is, let's say, the, uh, 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 the argument based on, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say it's a philological argument. Um, there's also a linguistic argument to be made to place um, the Sarah East Codex at the, let's say, at the earliest stages of the written language that we have, um, because it contains forms that are not uh, frequent or completely absent from all the later texts. 
Um, it contains uh, quite frequently a number of suffixes that uh, are, are not in, in later texts, nor in modern languages, modern Nubian languages. And so it's been our assumption that uh, if they don't appear in other old Nubian texts and they don't appear in modern Nubian languages, they're not an invention, but they're archaic. Um, and so that adds to the suggestion that this is uh, an, old, uh, an old translation. The copy that we are dealing with, so the codex itself uh, is not as old as the translation. So we're dealing here already with a copy of an earlier translation uh, because we found uh, several copying errors in the manuscript itself. And we also know that it was translated from Greek because we found certain errors that can only be made when you translate from Greek. Um, so these things are, I think, rather, uh, rather certain. So let me, let me have a look and if I can put the link to the article. It was recently published. Um, pom, pom, pom. Of course, I'm saying I'll, I'm giving you the article, but book chapters. Oh, I don't have it here. Um, I think that this... I'm, sent, I'm putting the link in here, which I think is a presentation. Um, I put it in the chat, um, which is a presentation that I, um, that touches upon this. Um, but otherwise I can, I can send you the, um, the link to this particular article as well. And I, I'm, I'm very sorry that I cannot, ah, here, wait, here we go. Um, so here's the, uh, um, here's the article itself. Come on, uh, copy, paste. Um, okay, there is another question that comes through Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the question is, uh, in the Christian kingdom of Aloha, uh, is there evidence that priests continue to write with Meritic behind Old Nubian um, and whether I have any references? So, uh, it's a very difficult question. Um, the fact that there are Meroitic signs in the Old Nubian alphabet points to the at least, you know, temporary existence of biliterate people in, in this area, right? Otherwise this alphabet could have never developed. Um, it means that there has been an overlap between Meroitic and Nubian literacy. Um, it is already difficult to establish that in, let, in the, the, the area of Nobadia and Makuria, probably Nobadia, uh, as that is where also Meritic texts are found. Um, it is nearly impossible to establish anything with any certainty uh, in, in, what is, uh, in what is Aloha. And I can, I can put up the, the, the map again. Um, oh, where is the map? Uh, here, right? So um, uh, I put a question mark, right? So, so we don't know exactly how this how this developed, right? So we know that Meroitic was written there because we have Meroitic texts. Um, we know actually also that Greek was written here. It's not indicated. Um, uh, from what I know, is there are currently excavations in Soba? So this is close to present day Khartoum. And the only thing they found so far are Greek inscriptions, um, uh, which makes it a very Southern attestation of the Greek language, which is absolutely fascinating, um, but, but no Nubian type of language. Uh, I'm of course hoping that they will find documents, um, but the problem is also that the climate here is quite different. And so the chances of finding, finding uh, 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 text on perishable materials um, unlike stone uh, is much smaller. So, I, I, you know, we, we really don't, we don't have any, um, we don't have any clue, in fact, about, uh, about how literacy develops in this area, except for the fact that um, we found some Nubian-like uh, text on stone. And so there's a marble inscription that's currently in Berlin and there are some graffiti in the pyramids uh, at uh, Musarawat. 
we don't know much about that language, uh, nor do we know anything about whether the people who wrote that also still wrote Neolithic. So that's uh, still an open question. Um, then there's a question of um, Asma about sharing um, the presentation and the recording. Yes, I am going, uh, if everything has gone well, this has been recorded and I will put them on YouTube and I will put also the slides uh, up on my Humanities Commons profile, uh, which is uh, so in the public domain. So everybody can download that and, and watch the presentation. So I really hope this worked with Zoom because it's the first time I'm trying to, to record something with Zoom. Um, so let's, let's hope that worked out. Um, are there any other questions? If not, then you have the link to my article written with Alexandros about the Sarah East Codex. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, coming in through Facebook, unless Mazin tells me there is. Um, so with that, I thank you for your um, attention. Uh, thanks very much for coming today. Um, and tomorrow at the same time, we'll be talking about nouns. Um, so we'll really dive into uh, the linguistic aspect uh, of the language and uh, we'll look at some sentences and, uh, and how the language behaves. So um, I hope to see you tomorrow. If you can make it, no problem. We'll put them online. I hope the next day, if not next week, but hopefully very soon. Um, so I'm now going to try and switch off Zoom if I somehow manage to do that. Thank you very much.